So God's handiwork arrives at a conclusion, a standard in quality, and that is, it is determined to be good. Okay, well, let's start talking about our artistic side. Let's get into our expression of our creativity that comes out in an art form. Clearly, it's around the world. We see it everywhere. People wanting to express the beauty, wonder, awe. You know, but do we even understand what makes art beautiful? A lot of what I hear is that art is in the eye of the beholder, but really what I see is art is valued. And how it's valued affects our view of it, positive or negative. Paintings like the Flaming June were once considered junk and now are considered masterpieces and are tourist attractions and art museums. You know that the Flaming June, it was actually painted in 1895, but it wasn't until the 1960s that it was actually even deemed valued art. And then there are paintings like this one that sell for millions out of the gate, but it looks like a five-year-old threw paint on a canvas. You kind of find it infuriating. You're like, yeah, keep, damn, that's not art. But the value placed on the art is what bothers you because if your five-year-old drew it, oh man, that thing would be beautiful. In fact, actually the thing that you're looking at, my five-year-old drew, and it is a gorgeous piece of artwork. So the value of beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? My favorite is the movie It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, you've seen it, and probably every Christmas you've seen it. But when the movie was released, did you know that it was a box office dud? No one paid any attention to it, and it got mixed reviews. And the director, Frank Capra, was deemed a hack until its copyright was accidentally not renewed. And the television station started playing it because it was just public domain now. It was just free for use. And now it's considered one of the best motion pictures ever made. Filmmakers study It's a Wonderful Life in order to make a masterpiece. Frank Capra was interviewed about the movie long after it was successful at the end of his life. When he says this, it was the damnest thing I've ever seen. The film has a life of its own now, and I can look at it like I had nothing to do with it. Now, I find it fascinating as someone who's been part of filmmaking to, to, to see the visionary experience the rejection of their work only to later have it praised and yet feel so disconnected. And I think it's because they've already accepted the criticism up to that point for themselves, that they believe it to be true. And they don't even remember why they made it in the first place. And, and to think about all the people who rejected it. You know, art is so subjective that the, the same group of people could, could hate it one minute and then love it the next. And, and then based on what? The, the mass opinion of the day? Imagine it lost forever. Imagine that we didn't have It's a Wonderful Life for every Christmas. It kind of helps paint an understanding of what it looks like to take creation for granted. The fact that we could live an entire life without appreciating the beauty of what has all been made, that we're so wrapped up in our business that we're just never in awe. Now, I actually think this is near impossible because beauty, the idea of beauty, and the concept that we can look at things and identify things as beauty, that, that we can even appreciate things, it all derives from God. You're never gonna hear me say this much about comfort, but uh, we're not supposed to chase after a life of comfortability, but we do experience comfort. We find things enjoyable, pleasing. Where do you think that comes from? And you don't have to believe in God. Everyone is experiencing this thing that God has given us. So every time that we find ourselves admiring, attracted, pleased, we are evoking a God-given responsive reaction to be able to identify beauty. But we can live an entire life never actually understanding the fact that we have a loving God who gave us this ability to respond to his creation in this way, that we can look upon things and find them to be wonderful. This is because God is not merely the creator. He's also God the artist. His creation isn't cold or sterile. It's vibrant, colorful, moving, emotional, tactile. It's a living masterpiece. His creation is attractive, but it's also satisfying. So God's handiwork arrives at a conclusion, a standard in quality, and that is, it is determined to be good. And this isn't decided by our own criticism. Oh my goodness, we're not even, we can't even be trusted with it's a wonderful life. God himself declares his creation to be good. And he does this from the beginning. As he creates, he establishes that his artistry is an expression of his goodness. 
And when we look at Genesis, God forms, he creates, and then he, after that he says, it is good that every work he creates, it showcases his character. He is the one that makes everything beautiful, not us. And this is because God is the source of all that is beautiful. That's why the scriptures say, the mighty one, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Everything within space and time, it was crafted to perfection. And it was created out of his goodness so that we may declare his goodness. And we're not the exception. Although, yes, we have fallen away. We've come up short. We do not always display his goodness honorably. We must remember that when God created us, when God said, let's make man in our own image, he declared us to be good. Even with the ability to one day rebel, he made us from his character. And his character is somewhere embedded in each of us, knowing, calling, crying to be displayed. It's longing to quote the scriptures, I praise you, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my, my soul knows it very well. We echo God's sentiment of his own work, that we can see the goodness of God through his work, and we find it brings us joy. And joy is all sorts of emotions. Any emotion that we express, it is in the enjoyment of his creation. Yes, even the sad ones. His artwork is, is meant to be interacted with, appreciated, loved, and admired. And his first artistic expression was one as a gardener. Not exactly the, the first kind of profession that I thought God would take on, but, but there it is. And Jesus establishes this analogy similar to kind of the potter and the clay. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. And we see this to be true from the beginning. Now the Lord God has planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Bible continues this in verse 15, when God put man in the garden so that we may take care of it. Eden gathered all of God's creativeness onto a tapestry given to us as a gift for us to experience God's artwork. Yet not just to observe, although that would be very satisfying, like sitting back and watching it like a movie, no, but to interact with it that we get to participate, but that we're enveloped in his work. And in the beginning, it was not just isolated, but with the artist himself. The greatest wonder of God's creation is that the artist's own interaction with his work. God walked among his garden. Christ walked among his people. Today, Christians walk in step with the Spirit. All that God has created is for that experience right there, that enjoyment. And all that he has created amplifies that beauty which shouts of his glory. So let's look at the first mention of this. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. See, so God's art is beautiful to us. That when, when we look upon his work, it is pleasing to the eye that we find it to be attractive to us. But it doesn't just end there. Notice that it does produce something else that's good for consumption. The fact that trees produce fruit. And when we eat this, it sustains us. It gives us life. And it was always God's intention that these two would be linked together, or as Thomas Terry and Ryan Lister point out, that they're a pair. In God's estimation, to know life is to know beauty, and to know beauty is to know life. To know both is to know God's purpose for the world. So recognizing beauty is part of understanding a life with God. But, but beauty, man, that can be distorted real quick when it's evaluated by a fallen creature, right? Our ability to assume the role of critic, to, to put ourselves in the seat where we're deciding what is good, what's not so good, what's a hot trend, what's not. It's us thinking that somehow we have established ourselves as the source of goodness. And when our own artistic expression no longer reflects the true source of inspiration, it finds value in directionless value, one that is valued by pride, acceptance, envy, or greed. We chase beauty for the wrong reasons and we label the wrong things beautiful. But between God and us, we measure completely differently. Our value system is on opposite ends. The, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. 
it's so much easier to mask our outward appearance than to actually deal with the rotting image of God inside of us, right? In our sinful nature, we do this, yet we know that we can't maintain it. We know that the mask isn't going to hold up, but we just kind of kick that bucket down the road, right? In hopes that we don't ever have to deal with it because we're all about the here and now. But we don't think eternally of what the consequences of what we're doing. It reminds me how scripture talks about how the tongue is connected to the heart, that everything that goes out, every action that's out there, it all originates from what's going on on the inside with us. It's like our children drawing horrific paintings. It's the classic teacher-parent conference trope, right? Right, that the teacher kind of holds up the piece of artwork with, with the kind of the grotesque thing, and we're like, something's kind of going on at home. We, we immediately know, we see what has been created, and we go, something's going on on the inside, right? Expression comes from the internal condition of our mind and soul. And this is where our collapse in sin originated and where scripture says God values the condition of our heart the most. For us, he has put his artistic expression on us by bearing his image. Now, we can view this externally, yeah, but God foremost views this internally, that his image is in his character, values, holiness, and righteousness. And all of that he's put in us as to be bearers of that image. In the garden, we were the purest reflection of the image of Christ. And we felt satisfied by God's beauty and wonder. So what happened? Well, let's examine Eve's breakdown with the serpent. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, that's about all the description you're going to get about these trees. Because in Scripture, the garden itself as a whole gets a clearer picture of its layout than the tree that we're meant to avoid, right? The Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Mm, Yeah, okay, God, but how how do I avoid eating from this tree if I don't know what the thing looks like? You know, you could think art for making the assumption that the fruit on the tree was apples, but that's not in scripture. And so you, you imagine you could avoid eating apples for the rest of your life just so that you don't mistakenly eat the forbidden fruit. But remember, the Bible's not written to the man of the garden. It's written to fallen man, that we've already eaten from the tree, that our inherited sin places us in the exact same spot as Adam and Eve. Adam is the perfect representative of each and every one of us, that our sinful nature is exactly the same. No one could have done it better or worse. And this is why we are very much in need to be transformed by Jesus' nature, because with, without him, we're everything in nature like Adam. And in this nature, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Through Adam brings death, but through Jesus' death brings life. And so after the serpent spreads its lie, you'll not certainly die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. When she saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Do you hear it? It's the exact same wording, pleasing to the eye. But the tree wasn't pleasing before. Not until she began to pursue it. And what's she pursuing really, right? It's the knowledge of what would it be like if I was God, right? Let me take the role, right? And so what she really pursues is disobedience. And she stared at that tree. And it didn't all of a sudden just blossom with flowers and fragrance to kind of lure her in, right? The tree didn't change. She did. She assumed the role of critic, and she changed the definer of goodness to herself. And suddenly, because she desired it, oh, this tree, it was beautiful to her. It was pleasing to the eye. This, when she saw, really helps us understand that there was nothing special about this tree by its outward appearance. It It was possibly identical to every other tree. It wasn't more pretty or less attractive than the rest. Disobedience was what was unattractive. And this is what is one of the most precious gifts about the Holy Spirit. And what he gives us today is a distaste for sin. 
that disobedience is unappealing. And he also gives us the ability to restore our vision of God's artistic beauty in all that is holy and righteous, that through the power of Jesus Christ, through his atonement for our poor taste in beauty, and I'm not, I'm not trying to make light of sin here, but the artist rejects our criticism and he rejects us redefining his goodness and Jesus displays his ultimate masterpiece, grace that through Jesus' promise and gift of the Holy Spirit, we through faith and mercy are able to walk in step with the artist. We're able to examine his creation with his insight and wisdom and enact his true goodness and how we express his beauty, which then in the end testifies of his wonder to a broken world. And we can be just like Paul who goes to say, that Jesus opens their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus.